Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the 44th episode of the PEM Podcast, Psychic Eye Mystery Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Laurie, with my wonderful, fabulous, amazing sister, Sandy. Um, and we're, <laughs> we are coming at you uh, on this kind of dreary Sunday afternoon. We're recording a couple of these actually in a row um, just to get some in the can. Um, whatever. Um, so <laughs> since I've been trying to, so I was like, Sandy this year, why don't we make each other gifts? Because like, it's just, you know, a thing, you know, just give each other things. Right. So I wanted to, make... I immediately bowed out of that. <laughs> she did. No. She did. But I'm committed. <laughs> I'm committed. I, so I am scared. I just, I just have to say I have spent more on supplies. <laughs> Than I would have spent on your entire birthday and Christmas combined. That's <laughs> and exciting. My, my first foray was yesterday, and it was a disaster. <laughs> this is why I said no yeah. up front. But but I have more supplies, so I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it. <laughs> I'm gonna keep trying every day this week until I get it. <laughs> You're yeah. not going to want to send it to me once it's done. You'll be like, I finally did it. No, 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 no. Like you, you, you just need to know it was made with love, but it does at this moment. I'm like, I'm optimistic that it looks like a 12 year old brought it home from camp. Like that's, that's, that's my optimistic view of what it will finally look like that it was made by, you know, an eight to 12 year old. Um, while away it. This is like that episode of friends where Chandler and Monica agree to make each other's Valentine's day gifts and. It's like a sock puppet and a hanger with like disaster. So I don't know how you just remember every episode of Friends. Like you just like, you equate kind of everything in life to. I do. Like that episode I live, Friends. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a sad, sad state of my I was working life in the 90s and missed a lot of uh, friends. That sounds like I was a lady of the night in the 90s. I wasn't, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> truly i wasn't <laughs> no one wanted to pay for it <laughs> but that's why i can't hear because i worked in um i was a cocktail waitress <laughs> and a bartender <laughs> and you in the rejected 80s. over and over again i don't want to hear it anymore <laughs> yeah no <laughs> i worked in a in a bar that had live music that was terrible <laughs> <laughs> we've killed sandy we'll be back after this commercial break <laughs> technical difficulties my sister's on the floor imagining me right. working nights so i'll just i'll just be quiet you can promote your book go ahead promote the book <laughs> ah the 90s such a i'll such get a myself point. together while you promote your book okay okay yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So book promotion, boop -a -doo. Uh, ghouls just haunt to have fun. This is the third book in the MJ holiday, um, ghost hunter mystery series. Um, and I don't remember where the idea for this book came from. Honestly, uh, I, I, maybe I pulled it out of my ass. I don't remember what the inspiration was. Um, but MJ, Oh, I know it. Did you, did I ever turn you on to the show most haunted? It was a British British show, Most Haunted. Who are we talking to right now? Okay, <laughs> me. We're talking to me. So no, okay. Did so not I turn will me on to a, a show really called quick Most story about Haunted. That. Yeah, I know you wouldn't have watched it, but I will tell a really quick story about that. So <clears throat> this was back when I was working, um, working and writing, and one of my coworkers. Um, I just gone on and on and on about Most Haunted and how great it was and. You know, it was, uh, it, she was like, I'm not going to watch that. That's scary. I'm like, it's not scary. It's not scary. It's just fascinating. It's really great. They go and they get out these locations and shit happens to them. And it's really cool. Right. So <clears throat> I convince her it's on Friday nights. I convince her to watch it this one Friday night. <laughs> Sandy, it was the scariest episode I have ever seen. I like couldn't watch the show for like months afterwards. It just scarred me. So I <laughs> she is not your friend anymore, right? No, she she still is. Luckily, You're dead to me. Um, but I remember coming in Monday <laughs> morning, just me. being like, 
I am so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. She's like, you have killed me. I had two hours sleep the whole weekend. You know, she's like sleeping with the lights on and cuddled up to her husband and everything. So um, yeah, I it was an, an incredibly scary episode. Um, so I don't even know if you can find it anymore. I don't know where you would find Most Haunted. Um, I think I might've looked once or twice and it, it got pulled off the air um, or it ran its course, whatever. Um, but if you can find some episodes of Most Haunted, well worth watching except for that one episode and that one last one episode it was like it was like a hell hell house where a demon came and attacked people and like it was it was scary it was really scary i don't know if it was staged or not but at the time it felt real so anyway so that's where that's where i got the idea long story longer for this book um so mj travels to san francisco she is part of a panel of other ghost hunters that is uh, looking for ghosts in a haunted hotel. And um, she finds more than she was marketing for. So ghouls just talk to have fun. Third book in the MJ Holiday Ghost Hunter Mystery Series. Pa! Um, so, oh, anecdote, right? Anecdote. I'm like, where do we go next? <laughs> it's like that one episode on Friends <laughs> where Rachel loses her mind. <laughs> Monica finds it, makes it cookies. <laughs> yeah, almost done. Almost, almost. The only episodes I remember on Friends were Phoebe Buffet's grandmother's cookie respi- res- recipe, right? Nestle too loud. <laughs> and je m'appelle Joey. <laughs> bon fou fou, Joey. <laughs> Which is, and I love because that's exactly how I speak French. Boom, 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 it's boom. true. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. Um, I actually had to, because I think Abby's now published in France recently. Um, she was sold into France and they just published it, I think last month. And so uh, the French publisher contacted me and they said, can you do a short video for your French fans? And I like, um, so I had to do this video and I called a dear friend of mine who uh, is one of the smartest people I know. He has a PhD or master's or something oh. in 14th century French uh, literature. Yes. Um, and he speaks- Thomas? Yeah, Thomas, yeah. He speaks uh, French so well that French people think he's, the French think he's French. And he speaks Italian so well that Italians think he's Italian. So he's, he's really just got a fantastic ear for, um, for languages. And it was- we were messaging each other back and forth and he would like have to record it. And then I would record my end and send it back to him. And he'd just be like, no, <laughs> say it this way. <laughs> and I still, it's so bad. It's so bad. I just, I don't know. It's, my tongue got blah, blah, blah. So whatever. Anyway, so uh, anecdote for this week. So it's, this is a personal one. Um, so Sandy and I were having a conversation about um, a dear friend of hers who has crossed over <clears throat> and uh, she was saying, you know, I just don't feel that they're around. And um, that kind of puzzled me because I feel that energy of that spirit around a lot. Um, so uh, I didn't say anything, you know, I'm just kind of giving my sister room, room to talk about it. And then, um, you know, love you, love you, hung up and I pull into traffic um, literally after, like literally after hanging up with her and I pulled into traffic trying to avoid an oncoming car because I'm a crazy driver and I pull in front of this car. Um, so, uh, I, I sent that to her and I'm like, well, I guess your friend is really around. Um, and this is a sign. So I, they immediately came into my mind and I was like, oh, give Sandy a kiss, uh, which I thought was so funny. Um, so yeah. So I pulled into traffic, nearly got killed for you. Just deliver a message to you. So Oop, thank you. You're thank you. You're welcome. It meant a lot. I know. It did. It yes. really did. Yeah. It really did. Good tears. Whole thing. I love you. They love you too. Lots. So, all right. Okay. So this week's case uh, is, has been recommended to us by Amanda Naughton. Thank you very much, Amanda. This was actually a case that was recommended to us early on in our, um, podcast venture. Um, and it, it is focused on Rachel Louise cook. 
who was a college student who vanished 20 years ago when she was out for a morning run. So for the 2001-2002 winter break from Mesa Junior College in San Diego, 19-year-old Rachel Cook returned to Georgetown, Texas with her boyfriend, Greg West, to visit with her parents, Janet and Robert Cook, for the holidays. The vivacious young community college student with a smile that lit up a room was the love was in love with her life. She loved living and going to school in California because of its temperate climate, endless coastline uh, that had beach access, and a lifestyle that gelled with her sensibilities. At the end of the upcoming semester, she was planning to transfer to a four-year college in Los Angeles to pursue a degree in fashion design. Rachel met Greg, a California native, shortly after she had enrolled at Mesa. The couple had quickly grown serious and had made plans to move in together. Rachel was excited to bring Greg home for her family to meet her new beau. During their visit, Rachel had confided to her sister Joanne that she felt Greg was the one. Shortly into the new year, Greg headed back to California so he could return to work and left Rachel behind so she could continue to visit with her family for a few more days until her classes resumed at Mesa Junior College. As a passionate member of their cross-country track team, Rachel had kept up with her distance running training throughout her holiday visit home. At about 8 a.m. on the morning of January 10th, 2002, Janet, after spotting Rachel asleep on the living room couch, quietly left the house for work. Robert exited shortly thereafter to head to his job and was looking forward to leaving work early to take Rachel shopping later that afternoon. Between 9 and 9.15 a.m., Rachel had a quick call with Greg, during which time she relayed that she was going to go for a short four to six mile run. Intending not to keep her, Rachel promised to call Greg back once she got, uh, when she got home from her workout. Dressed in a gray running outfit, a green sports bra, and Asics running shoes, Rachel attached her yellow Walkman on her arm, donned her sports-style headphones, and headed out the door at about 9.30 that morning. As she had done so many times before, she began her run in the quiet, rural, crime-free neighborhood where she grew up. As she ran to the east of her house, a man working on a piece of equipment spreading dirt for a new construction home spotted Rachel as she ran by. She also ran past her next-door neighbors, an elderly couple who were out taking their morning walk around the neighborhood. A total of six different people reported seeing Rachel running that morning. Some even witnessed her finishing her run and cooling down two houses from her parents' house at about 11 a.m. But that was the last time anyone would ever see or speak to Rachel Cook. She vanished on January 10th, 2002, within 200 yards of her home. At the time of her disappearance, Rachel was 5 foot 3 inches tall and weighed 115 pounds. She had blue hazel eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair with high and low lights. She also had multiple ear piercings, a navel piercing, and two heart-shaped cherries tattooed on her left shoulder, and a black star tattooed on her left foot near her pinky toe. Rachel Louise Cook would have turned 20 years of age on May 10th, 2002. What happened to this beautiful, fun-loving, lively young woman has remained a mystery for 20 years. Authorities have been rolled the help of the Texas Rangers, Austin PD, and the FBI to aid the Williamson County Sheriff's Office in their investigation. According to Williamson County Sheriff Mike Gleason, they've investigated over 2,000 tips, and to this day, police continue to receive calls about possible suspects. WS, I'm sorry, WCSO has eliminated numerous individuals suspected of involvement in Rachel's disappearance, including a 2006 confession from inmate Michael Keith Moore, who claimed that he had abducted the co-ed while she was out jogging, knocked her unconscious, drove her to a remote location, raped, and then killed her with a hammer. After murdering her, he wrapped her body in a tarp, weighted it with rocks, and dumped her body into the Manitorga Bay. Moore has had an extensive criminal history and has spent nearly all of his life in adult prison. At the time of his confession in Rachel's case, he was already in police custody after being convicted of murdering a young pregnant woman. He was scheduled to plead guilty to Rachel's murder when he suddenly backed out of the plea deal, admitting that he had fabricated the confession for preferential treatment. However, some investigators still believe that Moore's confession was accurate. Despite this, the charges were later dropped. In 2021, WCSO announced that they are currently looking for a subject who was living in the Georgetown area in 2002 and was an associate of Rachel's. This person is known to be involved with the cattle horse industry and has traveled to multiple cities throughout Texas. WCSO believes this person may have been may have mentioned to an acquaintance the details pertaining to Rachel's disappearance, likely speaking of the incident in a third person and distancing himself from any actual involvement. This person is not considered to be a suspect, but is a person of interest in Rachel's disappearance. In addition to this person, authorities continue to investigate the whereabouts of an unidentified Native American male in his late teens or early 20s who was seen talking to a female jogger, possibly Rachel, on the day she vanished. 
Witnesses told authorities that an unidentified male was driving a late model white or blue Chevrolet Camaro or Pontiac Trans Am with black or white or black stripes along the hood and the trunk. Some witnesses claimed to have seen two men inside the car. Authorities are also searching for information concerning a white pickup truck that was seen in the North Lake subdivision on January 10th. Witnesses stated that the sports car and the truck stopped along the road to speak to a jogger shortly after Rachel's disappearance. In April of 2018, investigators announced that they had impounded the Pontiac Trans Am in question after it was located in Dallas. The vehicle is linked to three persons of interest in Rachel's case. The FBI conducted an analysis of the vehicle and found possible presence of blood in the trunk of the vehicle. Unfortunately, in early 2022, Williamson County Sheriff's Commander John Foster revealed that the car ultimately contained no useful evidence. While Rachel's unsolved mystery is tainted by accusations of past shoddy police work, the goals of the on ongoing investigation remain clear. First, authorities want to find Rachel or her remains and give her family a degree of closure. And secondly, they want to bring the person or persons responsible for her disappearance to justice. In conjunction with the FBI, WCSO is offering up to $100,000 for information leading to the location of Rachel Cook. Unfortunately, Rachel's father, Robert Cook, <clears throat> um, passed away, but he, prior to his death, he became deeply immersed in a leading, in leading national missing persons organization called EquiSearch. He even traveled to Aruba to work with Natalie Holloway's case, but Rachel was his priority and he remained driven to solving his daughter's case. Um, that his determination ultimately led to the, the end of his marriage to Janet. And then he passed away in 2014 of natural causes at the young age of 59. Rachel's mother, Janet, has publicly declared, I want to know what happened. I want to bring my baby home, and I'm not going to quit. The sources for this story include True Crime Daily, Where is Rachel Cook? Texas Woman Remains Missing as Investigation is Renewed with the New Sheriff in Town, 12-1-17, updated 8-17-2020. FBI.gov, Rachel Louise Cook. The Charlie Project, Rachel Louise Cook. Unsolved Mysteries Wiki, Rachel Cook. KVUE.com. 20 years since the disappearance of Rachel Cook, Family Remains Hopeful by Pamela Kame, January 9, 2022. KVUE.com. 19 year, years later, the search continues for Rachel Cook by Brittany Eubank, January 10, 2021. Austin American Statesman, Williamson County Sheriff Searching for Man with Details about Missing Rachel Cook by Claire Osborne, 11021. And Austin American Statesman, Help Needed Today to Look for Teen by Monica Pol Polanco. 118 2002. So, Victoria, what do you think happened to poor Rachel? So, can I do a tiny little segue before I jump into what I think happened? You had said to me before before we started, make sure you describe the picture to those uh, of our fans that only listen to us. So, just so you know, the photo that I showed uh, the viewing audience was a photo of a red car, and on the back window of the red car was the word Sandy, very largely printed. And then a kiss right next to it. So that's what I was, what I was showing. Anyway, okay. So what happened to Rachel? Um, I think I, I didn't get any person related to her, her death. I do believe that she was killed. I do believe that she was killed quickly, but I don't think it was a person that killed her. I think that she went for a run. There's a trail just south of where she lived. Um, in the subdivision. Um, and uh, it's my opinion that either a mountain lion or a wild boar got her. That's my, that's my feeling. And that's why there's been absolutely no trace evidence of her body. Granted, Georgetown is a little bit north of kind of anything. <laughs> um, it's uh, north of Austin. It's east of Leander, where, where I used to live. And when Sandy came to visit me and when I was living in Leander, we went to a, a, a local trail, literally a local trail run by <clears throat> lots and lots of people and a boar, we think had been hit by a car. Um, and the thing was massive. It probably weighed 450 to 550 pounds. It was absolutely huge. And the tusks were, oh, good, two, two inches across. Um, so <laughs> like it, it wasn't that big a deal to me, but my sister... <laughs> thought it was a huge deal. <laughs> I wanted to go to the airport right away. Yeah. <laughs> Get me like, home to civilization. Like, what do you mean you have these things around here? And I'm like, they're all over the place. This is, you know, hill country. And Georgetown is definitely in hill country. This boar probably standing was 
three to three and a half feet tall. It was it was enormous. And wild boars are a real problem in Texas, like a, a terrible tro- uh, problem in Texas. I think there's something like 10 million of these things running around. Um, and they will, you know, they will kill anything in their path. Um, they eat um, all of the vegetation. They'll, they'll kill animals. They'll kill people. They are, if they're big enough, um, and they, they run fairly fast. So those around. And then I was telling Sandy a story of when I first moved to Austin, I was waiting for my house to be built. Um, I was on the uh, second floor of an apartment complex and there was a balcony. So I was sitting out on my balcony one late afternoon, probably around four thirty five o'clock at night. Um, and there was woods right that butted up uh, against the apartment complex <clears throat> and right across my path went a mountain lion. Um, so I personally think she was attacked by a mountain lion. Um, she was only five feet, five feet three, um, 115 pounds. I don't think she, that she stood a chance. Um, we had talked you and I a little bit about, um, the guy who confessed. Um, and, uh, I have, I have some problems with his story. First of all, uh, Mata, Matagorda Bay is South of Houston, um, uh, more towards, I think, Cor- Corpus Christi, Christi. So it's basically just off the Gulf of Mexico. So this would have been a four and a half to five hour drive for him. Um, so if he took her from Georgetown, rapes her, kills her, and then drives all the way <clears throat> south, um, four and a half, five hours to dump her, when he could have simply gone to Lake Travis, which is much closer, or the Colorado River, which is right there. Um, and Lake Travis is uh, it's a mile across, but it's 71 miles long. So, and it's very, very deep. It's, uh, Austin's central water source. And, um, so for him to have, uh, dumped her in there, um, would have been easy. There's a lot of, uh, it's not like the entire lake is rimmed with houses. There's a lot of trails that kind of go in there. There's like a thousand other places where this guy could have, could have dumped her. And then I question the fact that he's got a tarp and a hammer. So he grabs her. Okay. First of all, that's a two-man job. Um, so if he's driving the car or he's trying to, um, grab her as she's running, I'm assuming she was fairly quick. She's 19 years old. She was out on a regular jog. Um, she was probably running maybe an eight minute mile, eight, eight to eight and a half minute mile, maybe even faster. Um, that is not a pace uh, that you can do if you're not really a runner. So, um, he didn't strike me, um, from this, uh, fabulous, uh, biography that he was much of an athlete. So I think she could have outrun him. Um, and yes, I know women are, are taken all the time, you know, but I just am thinking about the logistics. So just from my point of view, last Thanksgiving, not this past Thanksgiving, but the one before I had decided to run. Um, I think I decided to run an eight miler, which is, was just this loop, uh, at this one particular trail. And it turned out that I was the absolute only person at this particular, uh, 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 trail and paved trail. Um, normally a lot of people around, but on Thanksgiving morning, I was the only one person there and a van came up and was slowly tracking my progress. Um, and, uh, I was kind of like, okay, I'm in trouble. Um, so I mapped out exit points and all I had to do really was increase my pace, um, and, uh, kind of ditch into sort of a wooded area. There was no logistical way for him to get out of the van, park the van, get out of the van and come get me because I could have outrun him. And I'm, what at that time I was 54. So, you know, I'm an old lady. Um, so, (laughs) so, uh, you know, I was probably running, I don't know, nine minute miles, something like that. Um, and you know, a sprint, I can probably bring it to about a seven and a half, eight minute mile. The guy in the van ain't going to chase me down. Um, so I have a problem with that logistic. It just doesn't feel like that happened. Um, the fact that he killed her with a hammer. So he's got a hammer handy and a tarp. Like he's just got those handy. Um, tire iron makes more sense than a, than a hammer. Maybe he had a toolbox. I don't know. What do he do for a living? 
You know, they I, like hammers, just not something you see in a car, tire iron, uh, rock, uh, anything else that's heavy and handy, but a hammer that just sounds contrived to me. Um, maybe he did. Um, I could be wrong, but I just can't put him at the scene. It just doesn't, there's no there, there. Um, so I think that she went for a run on that, uh, particular trail. Um, and that, uh, I think a mountain lion got her, honestly. Um, that's my, that's my theory. And that's why there's been, uh, no sign of her remains. No trace. No yeah. Trace. That's my thinking. Um, again, I could be wrong. I could be wrong about all of it. Um, but I don't think, you know, it's been 20 years and there's been no trace yeah. of her. Um, and there's all these, like, what were there? 1200 tips, 1250 t- tips, something like that. Since? Yeah. 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 And, and they go nowhere, right? Someone thought they saw, could have seen, maybe saw, you know, blah, blah, blah. She's a runner. Um, if she's going for a four and a half, four, four and a half to five mile run, the trail that's just South of that subdivision goes, uh, goes for about two miles out and two miles back. So if she's running a four and a half to five minute or excuse me, four and a half to five mile run from her house, it probably is to the next trailhead. It's probably two and a quarter to two and a half miles. So she would have, that would have been right around the distance that she would have run. And uh, that particular trail- Can I just not- say, I just, want, I just want to say really quickly that different articles quoted the distance that she was running. Most of them consistently said four miles, which makes sense in terms of the trail that you're suggesting she ran. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. could she have run around the neighborhood? She could have, but the neighborhood's fairly small. And in 2002, it was even smaller. Um, so I moved to Leander in 2012 uh, and Leander is west of where Georgetown is. But Leander was like, it was one of those like, they just had builder after builder after builder after builder building up houses over there. But you could tell the sections in Leander that had not seen anybody come in and um, develop them yet. No, so it was mostly farmland and the area all around Georgetown, same thing. So um, it just wasn't an area that was built up that had a lot of houses. Um, so subdivisions were fairly new um, and I, I just, I really think that she was too close to something that got her out there. And there was, there's also, I was telling Sam's, there was also a story of a woman who went for a run on that particular trail and she posted a warning, um, uh, attached to the website, um, or the, the location on the maps that she had, uh, she was coming back and just about to leave the trailhead and, uh, uh, what she described as a four foot long, three inch wide rattlesnake tried to, tried to bite her. She leapt out of the way, didn't bite her. Thank God. She started running and it changed her for 15 to 20 feet. So, uh, there's a lot in Texas that will, that will kill you out there. There's a lot, there's a lot in Texas that will kill you. There are scorpions, rattlesnakes, uh, mountain lions, boars. Um, there's a lot. So, uh, all of those of us who run in Texas know, uh, that there, I mean, I remember running I was training for a half marathon. I remember running uh, at 4 (laughs) a.m. by myself. Of course I did because I was an idiot. Um, And uh, ran past a a patch of woods and heard a growl. Um, And uh, it wasn't a dog growl. (laughs) So there are also coyotes out there. And those coyotes are fairly big um, and fairly bold. So um, I don't think she was attacked by a coyote, just so we're clear. I I truly think some kind of cat or a boar got her. That's my thinking. Well, I guess if that's your theory, then I'm grateful that it wasn't at the hands of um, someone who assaulted her. I hope um, that's, but I'm okay. sad. If she had yeah. passed away, I hope that it was a quick, you know, yeah. she never knew it. That's what I hope. Yeah. Because it's terrible to think that she was abducted. But, you know, that's also like where our minds go because she was such a beautiful woman. Um, So, of course, we'd think like someone saw her alone and grabbed her. Um, She probably thought it was the middle of the day. So she was fairly 
safe on a, on a trail that's fairly narrow. Um, not a lot of people visit, um, it looks like. So, um, yeah, it's sad, very sad. So, thank anyway. you for giving us your insights and thank you to Amanda for recommending the Thanks, case Amanda. and uh, really appreciate it. So no. do you have any theories on it, Sans? Did you get any feelings on this one? No, 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 no. I really Just didn't. like blink? Yes, very blink. See, and that's the thing is when someone is murdered, there's a lot of energy attached to it because you have intent and malice um, and then a sense of trying to cover it up. So there's, it's more than just killing someone. It's the energy leading up to and the energy afterward that leaves an imprint on the atmosphere, so to speak, the ether. And um, those things are easily identifiable um, for anybody who's kind of focused in on murders before. So for me, it's just all of that stuff is just missing. It's just not there. And then the story of this guy that he comes up with where he drove four and a half hours, that, you know, put her in, in a tarp, hit, killed her with a hammer, drove her four and a half hours to the Gulf of Mexico and dropped her there. No, oh, I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. Not at all. So that's my thinking. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your thinking. Well, my pleasure. <laughs> all right. Hey, you know, we should open up... <laughs> the gift I made for okay. you on the next podcast. <laughs> this concludes our podcast for the year 2022. So I can see the reaction very of much for tuning in on your face. Would yeah. you? So no. Rip the no. wrapping off no. of it. <laughs> Here's the thing though. Okay. I'm going to wrap that thing so beautifully that you'll at least be impressed with the way it was wrapped. That's, that's okay. I'm gonna, it's the presentation. Thank you for managing expectations. Now let's wrap up. Craft project. Speaking of wrapping up. <laughs> All right. I love you. I love you. Uh, thanks, Sandy. Uh, and thanks, fans. Oh, and if you want to learn more about me, the books, or sign up for a, a session with me, go to victorialaurie.com. So anything else, Sandy? Did I forget anything? No, that's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs>